Good morning. morning. Welcome to First Christian Church of Stowe. We extend our greetings greetings to those worshiping with us here today and those watching us online. Uh, Please take a moment to fill out the connection cards that are found in your bulletins or leave a message on whatever platform you are choosing to watch us on. Uh, Either way, we want to know you're with us, so drop us a note on whatever method works best for you. Uh, We would like to extend our prayers and condolences to Dorothy and Dave Robinson and and their family as they grieve the passing of Dorothy's father last weekend. Uh, We ask for God's comfort and healing during what is a uh, terribly difficult time. Uh, Barb Bell had successful shoulder surgery this past week and is home, so keep her in your prayers as she starts her road of recovery. Uh, This afternoon, all of us are invited to Elise Fabi's graduation party. It is at Heritage Barn in Silver Springs Park from 2 to 5 this afternoon. I believe the address is found in your bulletin. Loaves and Fishes Plus Pantry is this evening from 4 to 6. Anyone able and willing to attend and volunteer would be welcome with open arms, I am sure. Uh, Ice Cream Extreme is Tuesday, June 28th. The time is 6 to 8 from what I saw on on the screen. And VBS is the week of July 10th, so please see Anna and Rochelle about that. I know there's information in the bulletin about that as well. Uh, Our tree branch post-it note question for this week. What virtue will we cultivate this summer? I do like this question, so I'm curious to see what sort of answers everyone comes up with. So as we have the last two Sundays, write down your best answer on that post-it note that is in your bulletin. Uh, Place it on the tree branch as you leave the service today, and we'll take a look and see what answers you guys come up with. And I believe that is all I have for announcements. I kept it to like half a page today. You guys should be excited. As we move into our service and begin our worship this morning, please join me in the responsive call to worship found on the screens and in your bulletin. Rejoice in the Lord, O you right. Praise befits the upright. Our souls are raised through you, O Lord. You are our help and our shield. Praise the Lord. In you do our hearts find joy. We trust in your holy name. We gather together to form this community of believers, to worship and praise the God who loves us, protects us, and guides us, now and every day. So let us join together in singing our opening hymn, Sing Praise to God Who Reigns Above, number six in our hymnals and on the screens. Let us sing.
Today is a day of celebration for, celebration for two reasons. We celebrate Father's Day today, in which we honor those fathers and father figures in our lives. So take time today to reach out to your dad or those men who have served that role for you and show your appreciation and love for the guidance and support they provided. Remembering also that not everyone has that opportunity. So we lift up those individuals who, for one reason or another, may struggle with what this day is and what it represents. In addition, today we celebrate Juneteenth. Becoming a federal holiday of just last year, it is a celebration of the final end of this country's dark history of slavery. So we look on this day as a chance to renew our commitment to the principle that all individuals have the right to be treated fairly and equally in the eyes of their fellow man, and that we are all created in the image of God. So think about these celebrations as we continue our worship service today. And please join me in prayer. Dear God, our hearts and minds are open to you and your teachings, Lord. We ask you to give us wisdom, faith, compassion, and humility. May your spirit guide us, instructing us and inspiring us to serve you and serve our world through our words and our deeds. We thank you for our fathers or father figures, those individuals that have been role models for us in how we act, how to live, and how to treat those around us with the level of dignity and respect that they deserve. Let us work to be those role models for the next generation as well. May it be family, friend, or a stranger we come across. Let our actions show them how to live in this world and how to treat others in this world the way you instruct us. As Jesus commands us, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. May those commandments guide us as a church and as individuals as we come through this time of worship and go through our daily lives. In your name we pray. Amen. At work this week, I had a student start his clinical rotation with me. He's in grad school at Kent State, and so far, I really like him. He's intelligent, personable, engaging, hardworking, and seems to genuinely enjoy patient care, at least for the first three days he's been with me. <laughs> Unfortunately, and I admitted this to him on the very first day, I am terrible about introducing him to my patients when they come in. My routine is I'll ask how they're doing, how they felt after their last visit, we engage in whatever small amount of small talk I can muster, <laughs> and we just jump into whatever the plan is for that session. And I'm such a creature of habit that I often forget that he is even there, and we never actually acknowledge his presence. Fortunately, he has adapted well and will introduce himself when the patient comes in, taking all responsibility out of my hands, which I greatly appreciate. When we come to church, we can develop some of these same habits. We talk to the same people, sit in the same pews, have some of the same conversations. So take this moment now to break out of that shell. Greet someone new, ask a different question that leads to a new conversation but I won't ask you to sit somewhere different. That's just crazy talk.
morning. Any children to come for the children's moment today, children's time? Hi. Are you coming up? Good morning. What's your name? Addie. Hi, Addie. My name's Roger. I wondered if you wanted to look at my tie. Look at my tie. What's on my tie? Children. Children? And what are they doing? Playing. Playing, yes. And what else are they doing? Like this? Holding hands. Holding hands, yes. Well, Addie, I'm going to talk about a Bible story this morning in my sermon later that talks about listening to God. And sometimes, now I'm going to step back for me a second, sometimes God shouts, and sometimes God whispers to us. Which would you prefer? Would you whisper? You'd rather hear God whisper to you than shout? I think most of us are that way. Well, you know what? Sometimes God even talks to us. Just, when, we, just hold when we hold hands with somebody else and we feel like that person likes us and is friendly, and sometimes, can I hold your hand a second? Sometimes just a hand hold like that makes us feel like God loves us, just to know that someone cares. So listening to God is fun, but so is playing, huh? Yeah, you get to play with friends sometimes? Yeah. yeah? You gonna play with your dad today? No? <laughs> okay. Well, I hope that Addie, you and everyone else here, all of them too, will listen for God this week. Sometimes just in the touch of a hand or a hug, or sometimes in a voice. Okay? Good. Thanks for coming up. See you later. There is a rich man who is quite distressed over the prospect of not being able to take his riches with him when he died. So before he died, he loaded his briefcase with two gold bars from his private vault and left instructions to have the case locked with the key, handcuffed to his wrist, and the key placed into his grave clothes. His family carried out his orders correctly to the letter. When he appeared at the pearly gates, he had the briefcase with him, key in hand. St. Peter asked, what do you have in your suitcase? Very proudly, the man unlocked the case, opened it, and displayed his two gold bars. St. Peter said, isn't that special? You brought pavement. Gold bar, streets paved with gold. It's not as funny when I have to explain it. <laughs> we are asked to give of ourselves, our time, talent, and finances, to be a blessing to those around us, to serve those who need served, to glorify not ourselves, but a God who is given to us and for us. So do what you can and give what you can, not out of an obligation, not out of guilt, but out of joy, gratitude, and an awareness that it is our role as a church and as individuals to help whenever and wherever we can. We will now collect our gifts, tithes, and offerings. Please pray with me. 
Dear Lord, all that we have and all that we are is because of you. So we give back a portion of what we have to show our gratitude and to help those we serve through this church. Bless these givings as well as those who give in whatever means they have. Multiply its usefulness to allow these people and this place to be a light to a world that needs it. We ask this in your name. Amen. Well, good morning again. Happy Father's happy Day. Father's Day to all of you who are fathers or honoring fathers today, and happy Juneteenth as well. I'm not sure happy is the right, right word for that, except that tomorrow's a federal holiday now for bank workers and people like that. We'll feel good about it. But happy Juneteenth to all of you as well. I'll say more about that in a few minutes. Um, I realized last week that maybe not all of you, after I was done last week, maybe not all of you know me. I live in Kent. I've lived in Kent since 1986. Was the pastor of First Christian Church in Kent. I know some of you from there uh, for, for about a little over 11 years. And then I worked for our denomination, um, the region of Ohio. I know some of you from church camp and, and that ministry as well. And then I was at Hiram Christian Church, and I retired after five years at Disciples Christian Church in Cleveland Heights. All that time, I've been blessed and privileged to be able to live with my family in Kent, where I still live. I'm good friends with Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan, your pastor, and I are in a clergy peer group together, so I'm grateful that he is finally able to be on sabbatical this summer uh, looking for that long-needed rest, and I am happy always to be here leading this congregation where you all are not afraid to smile and laugh during worship. I appreciate that a lot. I was uh, texting, I, we have a, I have a son who lives in Kent, and two daughters, one in Boston and one in Kansas City. A few years ago, I was remembering this morning I got a text from my daughters wishing me Happy Father's Day and was remembering that a few years ago when I was a pastor on Sunday morning in Cleveland Heights, you know, I've been a pastor all my working life and no one ever calls me on Sunday morning. No one ever, they always know that I'm in church. So I got into the habit of not even turning my phone off Right after my daughter moved to Kansas City, the first Father's Day, which Kansas City's an hour behind, and she forgot that on Sunday morning, right in the middle of my sermon, <laughs> my phone rings, and it's my daughter calling to wish me Happy Father's Day. That was fun. I just got out my phone and talked to her, and <laughs> went right on with worship. I've always been happy to be part of a congregation where things like that don't matter. And um, I feel that way here as well. Scripture reading for today is 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 19. It's a story that's probably at least a little familiar to you. It's uh, one of the stories about the prophet Elijah. So this is the story from 1 Kings um, starting with verse 1, chapter 19, verse 1. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how Elijah had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and more also if, if I do not make your life like the life of one of those prophets by this time tomorrow. Then Elijah was afraid. He got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. 
Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him and said, get up and eat. Otherwise the journey will be too much for you. Elijah got up and ate and drank. Then he went in the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. At that place he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, go out and stand on the mountain before God, and for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces, before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? This is the word of the Lord for today. There is an old country song. I'm not a big fan of country, but you know, sometimes the words just stick with you. The old song is, Looking for love in all the wrong places. Do you know it? Looking for love in too many faces. It's one of those old country songs that just kind of sticks with you. Well, believe it or not, I was reminded of that song when I first read this story of Elijah that, that I just read to you. And I'm sure you're dying for an explanation on that one. Elijah was a prophet to the nation of Israel in about the 9th century B.C. <clears throat> Israel had already had a civil war and had split because there were two different kings that wanted to be in charge. So they had split by this time into the southern kingdom based in Jerusalem called Judah and the northern kingdom called Israel. So they kept the name Israel and were in the northern part of the Holy Land. Two kingdoms. Elijah was called in his life and ministry to speak truth to Ahab, king of the northern realm, who was married to none other than Jezebel, a name that conjures up lots of images for us, doesn't it? Jezebel gets a bad rap for good reason. The Israelites, both kingdoms, when they were together, were knit together with two threads. One was, of course, their common descendancy from Abraham and from the law of Moses. And the second thread that knit them together was, of course, monotheism, the worship of one God, God the creator, Yahweh, their God. Jezebel, who had chosen King Ahab and in a sense bewitched him to marry her, had defied both threads of Israel's common knitting together. She was, first of all, not an Israelite, a child of Abraham, and she worshipped Baal a pagan god instead of Yahweh. 
Elijah's ministry was to point out all the errors of Jezebel and, of course, of Ahab, her husband and the king of the northern kingdom. And that Elijah did. Elijah, to Jezebel and Ahab, was sort of like a fly, a house fly that, you know, you're sitting or a mosquito when you're outside that buzzes around your head and no matter how hard you hit yourself in the ear or on the back of the neck, you just can't get rid of that fly. It just zips around your head, feels like forever. That's the picture of Elijah to Ahab and Jezebel. And, first, and he was so annoying to them that they actually hated Elijah, the prophet of the Lord. And in 1 Kings 19, as you heard, Elijah is running for his life. He has just won a battle between Jezebel's prophets of Baal and him and the prophets of God. And Elijah ends up humiliating the prophets of Baal and, of course, Jezebel as well. And humiliation does not look good on a beautiful, powerful queen. Humiliation does not look good on her. And so Jezebel is hunting Elijah with all of her army to kill him. <sighs> Another religious war. And there you have it. In the story... Elijah is exhausted, he is depressed, he is frightened, he's worried, he's at wit's end. Verses 3 and 4 again, he's described this way. Then Elijah was afraid. He got up and fled for his life. He went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. Then asked that he might die. It is enough. Now, O oh Lord, take away my life. Now, I suspect that he had forgotten to take his uh, fancy Nalgene water bottle and his uh, wrapped up uh, energy bars with him. He was in bad straits. He was so tired, so afraid, he just wanted to die. Today, of course, besides being Sunday, is Juneteenth, a day long set aside by African Americans to remember June 19th, 1865, two months after the Civil War was over, when the Union Army finally arrived in the last bastion of slavery in Galveston, Texas, and proclaimed all of those enslaved people still there and across Texas to be free. So word finally arrived. The last enslaved people were freed, June 19, 1865. Reading about distressed, on-the-run Elijah in this story reminded me of the plight of slaves on the run from slave owners in the 1800s. One can only imagine the terrible stress and fear of escaped slaves working their way north, fearing for their lives, going through places like Stowe and Kent on their way to freedom farther north. Spirituals were born on plantations and on the run to express vocally the suffering the fear and the faith of enslaved peoples. It's a painful truth, and we all know it, that black men and women still do feel the stress of racism today in America, always looking over their shoulder for threats, always fearful of the next traffic stop, the next wall that will be put in front of them because of skin color. When he sat down under that puny broom tree in the desert, I can almost imagine Elijah singing a spiritual 
to express his pain. Or, of course, on a Broadway stage breaking into a rap song. Today's genre for expressing racism's pain and struggle. At his low point under that tree, Elijah found food and water miraculously. It sustained him physically for days, but he needed more. He needed to hear from God. He needed to hear God's next word of guidance for his life. So Elijah found himself in a cave on a holy mountain while searching for God and God's love. Verse 11, Elijah heard a great wind so strong that it was splitting the mountains and breaking rocks into pieces, but the voice of God was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the voice of God was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the voice of the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and stood at the mouth of the cave. There he finally heard the voice of God. Elijah had been looking for God in dramatic fashion. And God came not in the way that Elijah expected. God came in what an older biblical translation called a still, small voice. At his lowest point in life, Elijah rediscovered God's voice. He found hope and peace and guidance. Maybe it took so long for him because Elijah was not ready to hear God or was simply looking for God in all the wrong places. <clears throat> this is why I have learned in my life to practice meditation, to take extended breaks away from regular activities, to take time to quiet myself in prayer, to seek God's guidance for big and little things, not in some dramatic fashion, but in the still, small voice that comes to me like a whisper. Through reading scripture, through reading other kinds of literature, through silence and prayer, through sabbatical, through other people, through music. Jesus as we know from the stories in the Gospels, spent extended times in his life on retreat, away from other people, whether it be for an hour or for days, praying, listening for God, being in touch with God and allowing God to come to him. He, along with Elijah, is our example. It's my experience that the voice of God often comes to us not in the ways we imagine or even want, but God comes always, always comes, sometimes mysteriously, but God always comes. In fact, I believe that God never, ever leaves us. It is we who wander away from God. We have trouble listening for God, trouble recognizing God's voice, and trouble heeding God's voice even when we do hear it, abiding by that still, small voice clearly. Each of us have to find our best practices. They usually won't involve going off to a cave somewhere in the desert but we have to find our best practices to let go of stress and worry and fear and pain and anger so that we can make room for the still small voice of God in our churning minds. May that be your challenge and your gift this week. Amen.
been looking for God's still small voice as we enter the time of prayer together. Let's take a let's moment. take a moment of silence. Let us pray. Holy God, we give thanks and praise that even though we may feel abandoned, you are always as close as our breath. For you have filled us with the breath of your Spirit from the very beginning of our lives. We give thanks that at our highest and at our lowest, you are always ready to love, guide, fill and bless us with the peace and healing that can only come from you. God, help us to listen, to be aware of your overflowing presence. We confess that we have trouble listening. We get so wrapped up in achieving, in doing, in striving for things that we often have little room left for your still small voice in our minds. Help us to slow down enough to listen, to hear, to know that you are our God today and always. And we pray, O oh God, not just for ourselves, but for all of your big, wide creation. So many are in the midst of suffering today from natural disasters, from hunger, from violence, from racism, from war. We pray for a blessing from you and from us as we seek to be your hands and feet to all who suffer, your voice, your touch, your healing. May the balm of your healing love and peace be known today in our lives, O God, and for all of your children. Through Christ we pray, amen.
you were here last week, you heard me, week, talk, you heard me talk a little bit about um, our recent trip to Scotland. What a blessing and gift that was. Well, one of the most interesting things that happened while we were there was we were touring one of the many old castles of Scotland, Eileen Donnan Castle, way up in the northwest part of the country, right near the Isle of Skye. There with a few hundred of our nearest and closest friends <laughs> walking around <clears throat> when my wife hears a voice. Gail, is that you? It was a young lady from Hiram Christian Church where I had been pastor for 10 years, Olivia Cobb. There, um, she actually lives in Cleveland, goes to Case Western Reserve University, and there she was in Eileen Donnan Castle running to give me a giant hug in the midst of Northwest Scotland. Such, such a remarkable experience. Surprises come to us in so many ways, and at communion, Sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes, and almost never on Zoom or Facebook Live, but sometimes here in worship, in the midst of a community of followers of Jesus, I feel that kind of surprise, that in simple bread we eat every day, simple juice, we find the incredible, remarkable, loving presence of God in Jesus Christ, who is our Lord. May that be the experience that you have today, if not today, very soon in the Lord's Supper. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he broke it, gave thanks, and said to his disciples as he passed it to them, take and eat, this is my body broken for you, do this to remember me. In the same way he took a cup and after blessing it, he passed it among, him, among them and said, do this to remember me for this is the new covenant in my blood. And so as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup together, we proclaim our Lord's life and death and resurrection. Let us pray. Please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, we bring ourselves to this table, mindful of our shortcomings, but thankful for your grace. We know that you welcome us with open arms, and we ask forgiveness for those moments we fail to be what you want us to be. Bless this bread and cup. May it feed our spirits in a way that strengthens our relationship with you and emboldens us to live in a manner that honors you. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have felt or heard the still small voice of God in your life today and need to respond by affirming your faith or becoming a member of this church, you're invited to do so during the invitation hymn. Let's stand and sing it together.
go from this place seeking renewal and strength and hope to be God's hands and feet in the world. So go in peace, having received those gifts. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.